Lovanaka, Fakalofa Lahi Atu, Fakatalofa Atu, Kiorana, Malo Lele, Malo Ne Talofa Lava, Tina Koto Katoa, warm Pacific greetings to you all. It's lovely to be amongst friends from Tamaki Makoto and, and uh, around the more too. Um, welcome everyone to the seminar this afternoon. Um, Claire's name isn't here on the presentation slide. Uh, so Claire White-Smith is another collaborator um, uh, on this project uh, around digital platform use um, in uh, early childhood education. So while I'm here, um, while I'm here <laughs> talking with you this afternoon, uh, I'm actually here with my colleagues um, Jane White, uh, formerly from Waikato, now currently at RMIT, Tonya Rooney and Joss Nuttall and Claire Whitesmith from Australian Catholic University in um, Canberra, Melbourne, and Claire's actually in Brisbane. Um, and over the last uh, probably three, four, maybe five years, Joss and I have um, regularly conspired to get this project off the ground, and we're finally getting to the point where we have piloted a methodology and are looking to push forward into exploring digital platform use and the way that it's shaping teachers' work in contemporary early childhood practice. Uh, and so um, what I want to share with you this afternoon um, are some findings from that pilot study in actual fact, because um, we're not at the point of taking the work into, um, into a broader phase, although we are um, imminently there. Uh, we're at the moment getting our, um, our longer term plans and industry partnerships um, um, sorted for a push through into a longer term work in this, in this regard. And so today I've got some sensitising concepts really that I wanted to bring to you about this notion of seeing and about uh, the way that seeing through digital tools might be casting our work in new ways that we um, might want to think about in terms of consequences for learners learning and teachers work. So I'll get into it. Um, <clears throat> digital assessment might now be described as fairly ubiquitous practice for early childhood educators across our, um, Australia and New Zealand. And there are a variety of digital platforms readily available to teachers who are deploying them for lots of different reasons, including assessment. Thus, they're representing valued learning to a variety of new audiences through tools that we haven't yet really anticipated in terms of consequence for pedagogical decision making. The audiences include teachers' peers, their collaborators, their colleagues, families of course, governing bodies, student teachers, people like me who are in and out of early childhood centres, and children themselves. And despite their widespread espoused utility for teachers' work, very little is known empirically about how those digital platforms are actually being used, and the ways that learners and learning is being produced as a consequence. We all just know that we're doing it, because we see the product of it every day when we're in early childhood services. We would argue that even less is understood about the way teachers see and do not see through those that digitally oriented assistance that we've all taken up in the last few years. So the pilot study that underpins this paper is concerned with teachers' assessment practice when using digital platforms, and specifically how the use of those platforms may be changing teachers' work. This paper reports on some video stimulated recall interviews with teachers in New Zealand and in Australia, which was subject to an activity theory analysis so that we could explore how the cultural tools of di used in digital assessment might be remediating teachers' seeing and having implications for valued learning as a consequence. At the highest level, what we think we're seeing is the interplay of platforms and assessment frameworks as simulcra, that is, as representations of a thing that no longer have an original referent. And these platforms orient the ways teachers see and by association produce evidence of young learners and curriculum. The location of teachers seeing in public fora digitally with accountabilities and what this might mean for learning are considered. And we play with the concept promulgated by Jay Martin in his book Downcast Eyes 
to suggest that when seeing is digitally oriented and on an online platform, certain constructs of learning will be produced and by association valued over others. And so we want to see what our teachers are saying about the work that they're doing and how their seeing is being oriented. So, I've already said that digital assessment is fairly ubiquitous practice and we think relatively under-researched, especially in terms of teachers' work and conceptions of learning. New labour processes are proliferating. We now have lots of practices like checking, supervising, signing off on, comparing, gathering metadata, we even now have teachers adorning themselves in their bodily appearance every single day with video cameras around the neck or cameras or phones attached to in, in the pocket ready to be pulled out, iPads at the ready reach. And, uh, and we don't really know too much about the consequences or the relation between the assessment work that is going on in these digital platforms and pedagogical decision making although we do have quite a bit of evidence about the utility of these digital tools for improving home and early childhood centre partnership and or um, connections or communication over children's uh, activities and learning in the early childhood centre. And for those um, families who can access and use those digital platforms to communicate back to services with teachers over ideas around children's learning, the platforms are generally lauded for this functionality. So, what we're interested in thinking about here is the interplay. The interplay of teachers' practices, teachers' uses of tools, and the mediation of learning. What I will share with you this afternoon is some data about how the digital platforms teachers were using helped them see learning in particular ways. I'll share with you some information about what those teachers thought about what they saw, and I'll raise some questions for ongoing research and practice. But I want to g uh, give you a little bit more about this notion of seeing. So seeing is both a biological, mechanical function of optics. So the play of light, the way that your cones and rods work in your eyes, your lenses, the way that images are protected. And seeing is a function of meaning making. We always see from our subject position. We interpret using our frameworks that are cultural, historical, and situated. So if you looked at this picture that I'm projecting on the screen here, what do you see? Take a moment to describe it to the person sitting next to you. Who saw the same thing? Not many people. What was playing into your seeing? Your personal interest? Yep. Okay, so that's right. So the, so the um, physical uh, image product that's been produced. Your own experiences, your memory. Yeah, yeah. What did I see here? I saw coordinating hands. I saw manipulating Duplo. I saw an exploration of vertical space. I saw play. I saw intentionality. Probably what happened there was we all described this image using very different words and very different concepts, and that reflects our own positionality and our own eye function. We can't be sure that we're all seeing the same colours here either. So when we start to recognise the concept of seeing like this, our claims to truth and, our not, and claims to knowledge become far less firm. Since what can be seen is not only in the eyes of the beholder, but a function of how it is seen, by whom and with whom. Furthermore, when the seeing of something is mediated through an artefact, such as a photograph, a video, a published learning story, we note that the representation, the thing, the photo, the video, the learning story, gains precedence for meaning making. In effect, the representations potentially gain more status for meaning than the actual experience that we're reporting on. 
Different modes of knowledge production promulgate different types of seeing too. So when you're with a child, when you're interacting with them, when you're making decisions about what to do next, that's a different form of knowledge making and meaning making. Then taking a photograph or a, or a video, uploading it to something, writing about it, editing your words, talking to others about it, re-editing your words, having someone else edit your words, and then publishing it in some form. We're interested in seeing through, um, uh, through these very distant yet interconnected vantage points, including digitally through across, across time and space. And we're suggesting in this paper that these different combinations of seeing are casting teachers' eyes in new directions. And we want to ponder the extent to which those new practices might be supporting infants, toddlers and young children to be seen as learners, as personalities, or even as objects for transformation, intervention and manipulation themselves. Ocular centrism is another seeing related concept we have an interest in here. Ocular centricity or ocular centrism posits that the eye is all seeing, that it's uncontestable and that what we see represents truth even when we know it's an illusion like the phantasmagorical effect here. Technologies, especially in the 20th century, have recast seeing in new ways, prompted a lot by the rise of the moving image and more recently social media. These technologies act in the service of ocular productions. They actually create illusions that seek to make audiences actually unaware of the many, many manipulations taking place as representations get made, get remade, get shared, get manipulated, get liked such that the intermingling of the technological, the biological and the social worlds are almost becoming impossible to disentangle now. In our pilot, we take this idea of ocular centrism and exploit it against the lens of activity theory, based on the inspiration of Jay Martin's postmodern critique in Downcast Eyes. So really what we're interested in here is the practices of pedagogical seeing that are occurring in early childhood services through new and co-constituted recast digital eyes that are casting teachers' um, view in um, a new and very rapidly moving ways. Martin discusses a fundamental struggle across all forms of art and science that posits seeing as broadly an apprehension of truth or speculative aesthetic insight through to seeing as intuitive thought or feeling, and to associated notions of seeing as believing. Without recognition of this struggle or this breadth of seeing, Martin says seeing becomes an effortless event. We are, of course, at an ocular-centric time. That it and it becomes effortless, and that it, and so it may be harnessed and accountabilities that are all too certain about what might be retrievable through the authorial gaze. What's considered meaningful is made and remade through active and ongoing negotiations of positioning power and what is seen or not from various perspectives. How is our seeing being altered through such digitally cast eyes? And how are learners learning being constructed and what are our consequences for pedagogical decision making? So here are the questions that arise for us from Jay's claims. We're wondering about digital platform use and assessment work, and we're wondering about the remediation of teachers seeing. We understand seeing now as, a human, as human activity bound up in lots of wider webs of practice, including assessment practice, including digital technologies and the like. And we wonder if seeing as a professional practice is starting to take precedence over direct interactions with children. How often are we being required or asked to document? How often are we documenting over actually being with children? How many of you have had this thought before? <laughs> Here's the teacher taking a photograph, thinking when the student may be looking sideways at them or the parent that's just walked in the door to see if this is the kind of place they might want to bring their child to. 
I'm actually not playing with my phone. I'm documenting learning. It's the interpretive forms of seeing that we're thinking about in this project. Specifically, how did teachers see learning when they created assessment, learning stories in actual fact, using digital platforms? Because seeing on assessment platforms is always framed, literally and figuratively, and framed across time and space. And we wonder what effects those digital platforms might be having on what can be seen. Why does it matter? We think it's important to ask these questions because teachers make professional judgments about what they see and what evidence they publish to be seen every day. And they also make interpretations of what they see in order to foster children's learning. And if the seeing is being framed in particular ways, we wonder what the warrant is for what teachers are doing. We wonder if the implications for professional autonomy and for children, ex children's experiences of being seen are. So let me tell you what we did. Our pilot. Uh, we worked in four early childhood settings with an activity theory framed work shadowing and interview protocol. Field work involved three stages at each site. So first up, we actually went to work with teachers for a day. We followed them round uh, taking pen and paper notes of, uh, of everything we thought they were doing that was assessment related. So if a teacher had, in my case, um, a conversation with a child about what the child was doing, I was writing that conversation down because for me that's assessment, that's formative assessment in the, in the busyness of the teaching and learning um, interaction. If they picked up a camera, took a photograph, I documented that. If they uh, had a conversation with a parent who was coming in or leaving or with another teacher about something they'd noticed about a child's play, I wrote that down. So it was a big day with lots of notes. Because as we know, when you conceive of assessment as curriculum in that way, it's everywhere all the time. So uh, we did um, work shadowing of teachers. Then, the next day, um, we went in, well I did in my case, each case ran slightly differently in terms of the timing, but this was the uh, general protocol. I went to non-contact with my teacher. And I sat with the teacher as they um, produced assessment data using a computer and a digital platform and other tools at their disposable in the office. And they also shot into the bathroom to clean up or turn off the tap that was you know, running and the water was everywhere. And they also had this child on their hip and they also uploaded everyone else's photographs because they were the only person that knew how to do it. And so I sat there uh, for the hour, non-contact, videoed the non-contact time as well and had the teacher talking to me about what they were doing as they were doing the work. This is one of the um, act things about activity theory, you have to kind of be situated with what teachers are doing. And then I needed two days because it was quite a lot of data to transcribe and reproduce in a form that was usable that I could go back and talk to the teacher about. And we had a three hour interview. They came in for a morning, we sat and we watched the video of the non-contact time. And we talked about what they were doing, why they were doing it, they were explaining what they, um, the decisions they were making, we were remarking on the things we were noticed. And so we had, we had an interview. So this was our, um, our data um, production protocol. Um, it ended with the think aloud about what they were doing. And that, um, uh, and that process uh, generated quite a lot of data from each of our four sites and allowed us to start thinking about um, uh, the digital assessment use, uh, digital platform use in the early childhood environment. So we started by thinking about, well, how are the tools remediating um, teachers' work and notions of learners and learning? So what we did um, to address this question uh, was we went to the post-work shadowing interview and we examined that those interviews with the following questions in mind. We said to ourselves, what were the teachers telling us about what they saw or how they saw learning when they used their camera or smartphone uh, or other tool to record images of children? 
and how do the digital tools help teachers see? I'm going to share data with you about the second question, how do the digital tools help teachers to see? So, teachers talked about learning in a way that we named taggable, malleable, manipulable towards particular interpretations. If the texts and photographs that were uploaded could be read through preloaded tags or templates that were inside the digital platforms, learning of a particular sort could be recognised and the software features could be used to help a particular kind of seeing in relation to the data that was being put into them. When the narratives that were getting written could be mapped to values of the service or to a formal curriculum, it provided evidence of the requisite types of learning that were required to be produced by teachers, although not all teachers agreed that, um, that these tags um, were particularly sufficient for their site. So a Waikato teacher said, for instance, the tags that come from the software aren't necessarily always quite right. You're tagging because you feel you have to tag because that's what's expected. The function of tags in shaping how to read particular combinations of words and images was explained as being able to run the mouse over the tag to get the meaning a feature underscored by a Melbourne teacher who talked about adding learning leaks and picking what was relevant. So we saw learning being recognised as something taggable and malleable towards particular interpretations that were either built in already to the functionality of the digital platforms or built in by the services themselves. And it is true that many services do do this and in fact it is very, um, it's strongly encouraged um, for a service to do this, to help them shape the uh, valued learning that they want, that they agreed with their community to try and document. Learning was also trackable, and by association with the trackability, temporal, because if you're tracking something, there is a time element of it, very useful feature for some people and quantifiable. By using some of the additional features of digital platforms, educators could track the number of assessments written about a child. They could track over time a particular learning focus that they were being um, focusing on. Or they could track other people's engagement with the data that was published, like how many people had viewed the uh, published learning story. One teacher said, it's helped me to focus on the child and whether I've got a very good overview of that child. It also makes it easier to make sure you're tracking everyone in the Canberra, this was. And a Waikato teacher said, it tells you who's missed out on stories. It says whether it was a group story or an individual story. It's got story view counts. How many people have logged in and seen this story? We print all this out, we put it on the office door so it's there in our faces. Now, do you recall that one of the things that we're interested in with this project is the advent of new teachers' work practices? <laughs> well, here's one here. This idea that we can and should be tracking views. To what end? And the notion of a very good overview, yes, but in relation to the scope and breadth of tagability within the digital platform, because that's what's being recognised, seen and valued and produced as learning with, this, with these tools. We also noted a sense of needing to tell complete accounts of children's learning through the digital platforms. A more structured, formal, publishable, complete account was warranted for two main reasons. First, most teachers told us that they needed to have their assessment information signed off on by someone in higher authority before it could be released to children and families, which meant the assessment needed to be understood by finished as the first author, first author with the digital platform, not first author, child with teacher in curriculum, doing stuff together and play, but first author in the digital platform. 
um, needed to be finished by that author before the second supervisor could edit where necessary and consent to the information's release. But also teachers needed to be sure that their sense of having noticed and recognised something of potential for documentation value was actually going to be something considered worthwhile documenting post hoc, something they thought of as real enough for them to write up. Teachers sometimes refused to publish stories or to share evidence because they weren't decided if there was a story to tell yet. So this in itself suggests that the idea that learning is complete actually is important. And here's a teacher telling us, I know that there are stories that I just don't publish because it's just not a story yet. It's not a story yet because I haven't figured out how to write it. And so that continued over the whole week, so that story's still unfinished. So I was trying to bring all these idea ideas into the software. So there's this notion of completeness uh, um, as one of the ways that learning is needing to be seen. Teachers also spoke a great deal about the audiences for whom they were producing their assessment accounts. During interviews, very little emphasis was placed on children's perspectives on the learning that was being produced. Um, so much so that most teachers actually felt the need to co-produce physical paper-based portfolios, which they felt children valued more, as a kind of archive of their experiences. Instead, importance was placed on two other primary audience audiences. The first was parents, and the second was accountable others who would have checked who would check the assessments, met the criteria that teachers perceived they had to meet concerning how learning would be produced in their service. Teachers' uh, awareness of both of those audiences, the parents and the people they were being accountable to, meant that they censored what they would report on the platforms to ensure that their accounts corroborated with families and did not present undesirable truth and also that the stories they published acted as a professional demonstration of their understanding of learning. These had a serious me mediating effect. When parents were invited to provide feedback, teachers talked about the endless space available to them in the platform and the range of responses this generated. In one case, they said a parent wrote screeds and screeds and screeds that she wanted us to know about their child. And there are others with other instances where families don't contribute at all. So teachers told us that um, they used the digital platforms to get a sense that parents knew, that they knew, that they, they knew their children. So here's a teacher telling us they do know my child through what the parent would see in the um, digital platform. This is totally what my kid would be doing. Another teacher said, every parent wants to know their child is happy, that their child is loved, their child is growing in mana, and if the parent can see that, then they're very happy. But, as I said earlier, some parents aren't going to sign in to log in. No matter what you do, they just don't log in. Overwhelmingly, teachers reported increases in, in parental contact as a result of platform use for a lot of parents, not everybody. When it happened, they saw this as a, as, a, as a source of shared information, of connection, of an affirmation of their own forms of seeing. One teacher articulated her emphasis accordingly. As I've said, everyone wants to know that this would be, uh, the parent wants to know this is what my kid would be totally doing. So not only were assessments seen by many families and other teachers, but they were also routinely submitted to managers and leaders for checking against additional organisation criteria or policy. In some cases, they were used as evidence in staff appraisal. It's a whole new form of labour process happening there. Um, concerns about requirements imposed on teachers were raised, like the frequency of entries, the range and scope that was uh, reported on, various new procedures for checking, were visibilized through this, uh, through our observations. Whether teachers were getting it right for various audiences, etc., became a, an interesting conversation point. Others lamented their lack of proficiency with using the tools. There's still a lot of 
for these teachers. Well, I'm the one who knows how to upload, download the photos, upload the photos, so I get to do the 387 from yesterday, as well as write about my six own. The time taken over this work was a repeated issue. Time taken away in deference to other priorities, such as being with children, talking to peers, your colleagues, talking to families. And I'm not even going into the work that happens at home. <laughs> uh, because of, co of course these things transfer, they're accessible, easily accessible from home through people's telephones, iPads and home PCs. So there's a sense of learning as being co-constituted. When we're in agreement that this is what's going on, then it's, val it's uh, valid. So, what are we starting to think about understanding what is seen and valued? We think we're getting a picture here of some fairly um, important tensions that teachers are navigating as they work with digital tools and assessment platforms in ECE. Decisions about what to tag, how to tag, how to alter images, how to alter text to reflect teachers' interpretations of a tag. These are continual decision-making practices that teachers are involved in. In the work shadowing aspect of our project, we have close-up data of the extent to which teachers are arranging and rearranging the story to match the predetermined criteria, the tags, and identified learning focus or other values they have about things like, for instance, child voice. So my teacher sat there got to a point in the narrative they were writing, uh, hand off the keyboard, hand off the mouse, to reach over to grab the paper and pen notebook where the previous evening they had written their recollection of a conversation that they'd had about the child in anticipation of doing something the next day so that they could get the words that the child spoke absolutely right, otherwise it's not the truth. So. Lots of tensions and new labour processes there. Um, teachers are also making lots of decisions about the range of documented assessment and what counts as sufficiency in terms of actual and imagined expectations around what it is, how many times we have to document, what's the frequency of this. Teachers' decisions to write learning stories in this digital tools are often motivated by what the software tells them is already documented for children in terms of breadth, frequency, scope. It may be that learning stories or narratives, whatever you call them, it may be that they get written because there's a perceived gap. Remember the teacher that said before, I get a really good overview of what there is and what's missing. It may be that um, assessment data is produced because there is a perceived gap. This has little to do with gathering assessment information and using it for the design of teaching in the interests of learning. <laughs> Something I'm very interested in exploring, the consequential validity of these practices. The software demands a sense of a completeness, but this is really insufficient. It's very troubling, this idea that the learning has to be finished before we can document it, because it's insufficient in the early years where learning is so open-ended and fragmented and stop-start. And so there's this real tension built into the narrative form, actually, of beginning, middle, end um, that we're taking up. And these tools, you know, it's a page and it's literally structured like this with the what next, which may or may not be used. And so there's all this way the teach that you know this tool is teaching us to work uh, and frame and see learning in a particular way. So um, uh, yes, and also there are implications for what we cannot see <laughs> through these digitally cast eyes. We're interested in understanding more about this. An Otago teacher said to us, you have to capture their thinking. You can't really capture their thinking through the picture because it doesn't have their words. You, can't, you, you, you need their thoughts. 
Of course, sometimes people use video that captures children's talking, or audio that captures children's talking. Others in the Waikato told us, you feel as if you've always got to have a picture or a video. So there's plenty of learning events from the teacher's perspective that get emitted from the digital platforms because of the ocular-centric nature of them. You feel you've always got to have something. I want to get out of the habit of saying, oh, this amazing thing has happened, but I can't write a good story about it because I don't capture it right. There's nothing visual, and the digital platform's a visual platform, but I don't have any picture to put up there. So there's potentially a heap of work that's not being documented and can't be seen through the ocular-centric tools. So of course, oh sorry, <laughs> I should have clicked that, that would have been helpful. These, these um, early thoughts raise a lot more questions than give us answers concerning how teachers can or should see learning through digital assessment, uh, through digital platforms. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute, why I keep correcting myself from digital assessment to digital platforms. I'll come back to that. Um, anyway, <clears throat> as such, we start, we're starting to have some important discussions, I think, considering the materialities that are produced out of digital platforms and relations to perceptions of, that we build of children, perceptions that we build of learning, and what the consequences are for teachers' work practices. Our eyes are not passive, and the digital spaces that we are using now are casting them in new network directions that we have no control of. This is what Engstrom would call a runaway object. It's something that's made by humans but is now out of human control, like climate crisis. As such, our observations of teachers' work in this pilot, it's only a pilot, <laughs> are beginning to lay bare teachers' seeing encounters with others, for others and on behalf of others, not least the children whose lives are being seen and framed accordingly. So, what can I, where, can I, where can I finish? A key area that we're thinking about um, expanding on as we move this project forward is to understand more about the ocularisation of assessment with these digital tools. We also want to know about how these tools, well, whether, if, could these tools have an impact for those families who aren't actually engaging yet with them. Um, or for people like me who are sick of living their lives online <laughs> and who are just at the point of pulling everything back because we've had this extraordinary pub public proliferation of ourselves over the last 10 to 15 years that just feels like it's getting out of hand. Well, for me. You're videoing this, right? <laughs> um, yes. There are new democratic challenges to assessment and to teachers' practice that warrant careful consideration. Um, we're interested in thinking about the degree to which these digital platform, the features and the products are taking precedent over teachers' professional judgments. If we can't reason with each other in the moment, make our sense, change our mind, because we've got to tag it and fix it to this, then that has serious consequences for how meaning making and how our, how our meaning making changes over time as new information comes to hand. And we believe in teacher, teacher judgment making. That's why we have a profession of teachers. That's our job. We're also interested in this struggle for completeness and sufficiently overtaking a sense of learning as partial, messy, and sometimes very brief. So what about all those meaningful, really small things that happen that have huge consequences for children's participation, mana, learning identities, resilience, whatever it is that, that is valued in that place. And of course, coming back to the ocular-centric nature of these platforms, are we actually promulgating new kinds of truths and aesthetics through our digital assessment work, and does it matter? Because, you know, we have to be seen to be seen <laughs> in particular ways. And uh, this production, 
the standardised production of children through these platforms is having uh, a real impact on our sense of aesthetic about what is legitimate, value, valued and valuable knowledge or not. There is plenty to go on with. But I'm pretty sure I'll stop there, um, except I just want to tell you that one thing about that I pulled myself up on. Um, I kept, I kept uh, pulling myself back on saying digital assessment and digital platform. Where we started was an interest in digital assessment. The, this research team met two weeks ago for three days. I'm pretty sure it was the source of the um, bushfires in, Mel in, uh, in uh, New South Wales, to be honest, but you know, there's so much heat coming out of the room. But um, I really started to question whether or not this is assessment. Um, and so we started thinking through this concept of digital assessment technologies. I'm not so sure that this is assessment. It might be something else. That's okay, but we're delving into that problem too. Not Ada, thank you for your attention um, this afternoon. I'm more than happy to take some questions and uh, I'll stop there. No, so the question is, were there big differences between what was the data coming out of Australia and New Zealand? No. Um, although, uh, I, think, um, pro I think there, is, there are more uh, formalised assessment frameworks being used in Australia that are much more developmentally oriented, and it's a function of the social cultural context in which the teachers are working. Plus, there's a two-tier system much more evident in Australia, right, with teachers and so qualified and qualified teachers and teacher assistant work, so there's a lot more supervision. But the two sites who worked in New Zealand talked about checking off as well. Yeah, but it seems more, it seems, to me as a New Zealander, it feels more institutionalised through the structures that, that um, and those services that were in, in Australia. Yeah, but no, and the, um, and the teachers we've talked to, uh, this presentation we've done three times in Australia, uh, resonated very strongly um, with, with teachers there. Thank you. Um, Alex, I'm so excited by this research. I think this is fantastic. What I just have a hit I'm just wondering, that someone, you know, I agree with you about the question of whether this is an assessment, and I think what's also driving things is the whole thing around parents' aspirations and being seen that you've got to. Yes, a communication and a reporting with parents. Yep, I agree with you. And sometimes it's about what's the being published, and sometimes it's not. I'm, I'm very excited by this work. I think it's really timely for you to be doing it. And I'm, I'm got a feeling that you're seeing is that the whole issue. Of Mm. and how this is throwing teachers into a place where they are losing the sense of their own professional judgment and I think that's really sad. Um, and I, I, I'm looking forward to full study. I think it's, it's, it's really timely in terms of lots of the issues you've raised have been discussed by our group in terms of our concerns around why people are doing documents no, no, it's there, the accountable others. Mm. Um, and that's a tragedy. And, and how's the era navigating this platform? Um, that's, I don't know if you're going to interrogate some of those things. How do they interrogate it and how's this impacting? Mm. And what, that, what do they see in relationship to this power assessment and this mm. So many questions in my head. Yeah, and you know, um, I just keep coming back to the where this started for us in New Zealand, at least. Uh, the learning story framework was only ever to illustrate a process, an everyday complex process of situated meeting making, uh, planning on the hoof, formative assessment practice with children as you go, and as I said, Engstrom would call it a Maria, a runaway object. It's, uh, it's just taking a life. Uh, and the labour implications 
So, um, uh, Justine, you said weaving te is out today, eh? Okay, so I'm just going to say it again. <laughs> weaving te the third is out today. There's a fabulous assessment chapter by Wendy et al. There's also another assessment chapter in there by me, which is based on this on this um, project, out of this project. Um, and I encourage you to read it. I wonder how familiar you'll be with sitting there for nearly 40 minutes of our 60 minute non-contact time waiting for photos to download and upload. <laughs> so there has to be a cost benefit question raised here. Seriously. Kia ora. Thank you so much. It was, um, it, it was awesome to be sitting here and when you said you know, you're closing. I was like, really? It was just so gripping. Like, I just really, the way you, um, the way you language what you're saying and the thought that's behind it, just really appreciate it. Um, the, in the time that the first day when you were shadowing and you said you were recording um, things that had to do with assessment, Mm -hmm. In your description, I have two questions, so I'll ask the first one. What did you not record? Yeah, actually, I pretty much did a running record of the teacher's day. Pretty much. I did, personally. Um, yep. Okay. It was a big day. All right. <laughs> the second one, um, how is the research team using this re reflexively, knowing that what you're recording and what you're seeing, how are you protecting, challenging, re reflecting on your gaze, on the teacher's gaze? Yeah, so we're, we're quite a diverse uh, research team. Is the first is the first kind of defence we have to the robustness of our analysis. This early foray into the um, pilot data is fairly philosophically situated. Um, Jane is a philosoph educational philosopher, so Jane's taken us there, and she's the chair of AVP. So this is the visuality coming through. So. Uh, I'm a post-structural Foucaultian, da -da, I'm all over the gaze and the document and who it's produced and da-da-da, you know. Joss is so here in the material world with chat. <laughs> uh, Tonya uh, uh, brings um, a digital, digital technology element to this uh, project to um, test our thinking. Um, and Claire is the assessment guru. So across the five of us, we're all coming at this from quite a different um, uh, position and holding each other. Well, I, like I said, we probably started the bushfires. You know, there was a lot of debate and contest <laughs> amongst us as a research team. Um, so that's one thing that we're doing, is actually making sure that we've, we're um, internally testing and retesting. Uh, what we think we're seeing. Uh, we're also being really overt about what we're seeing and not shying away from the fact that I'm always going to be interested in those notions of power and surveillance and teachers' work. Uh, Joss is always going to be interested in the labour process, so, so that's another way that we're, we're kind of um, uh, firming up that kind of analysis as well. So, and so we're being overt about it. Um, I don't think we're trying to get to um, a particularly unified answer to any of this either. We're also looking to generate questions because we just, like I say, runaway object. We just don't know um, what it is that we uh, might see and not see yet. Um, and so I think um, the next stage uh, where we're looking to partner with some industry groups will possibly shape us in another direction as well towards what those industry groups, like teacher groups, uh, might be interested in um, looking at as well. So does that, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think there's quite a lot of internal uh, dis debate and tension amongst the team that 
tries us not to delve down a particular way. Um, I'm interested in this idea of representation and what it does to dilute and the adultification of children. And so the idea of doctoring images. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And tidying it up, mm -hmm. so to speak, I'm guessing that's part of that. That is part of what we're seeing, absolutely. Yeah, so what do you think about that idea of completeness and sufficiency and how that relates to making children adult-like in our representations? Mm -hmm. I don't think I have a response on the adult-like uh, issue. But it does speak to me of children as, as something being finished in some respect. And I just, just don't think this is helpful in a, in a sector or a field where we're all about the potential of who we may yet become, or who we are becoming in the everyday, right? Which is different to how it was yesterday and heaven knows what it'll be tomorrow. So this, this tendency to fix people and that be the, the accepted story um, for, a, for however long, and with consequences as children move through into other education sectors or into other rooms in the service or, you know, it, um, that, those things presuppose who you are when you turn up <laughs> and you might be quite a different person by then. And I can't read that as particularly helpful because I would always want to be open to, or maybe I would read that, maybe we should be thinking about reading that with a with a, at, at a point in time, and that may be different now, I'm not sure. But I do think there is a real tension there with the dy dynamism and the mobility of sense of self and who we are in, in different places with different people and things. Yeah. I was going to say, this whole notion of capturing the experience or the moment, you know, it's, when we go travelling, you're just constantly taking pictures of selfies and yeah. capturing the moment instead of being. Yeah. And there's that sense of that going on. How do they balance that? How did you, the children like always being seen by somebody in the mind? Yeah, so I mean that's an excellent question and there are studies and um, papers out there that will talk about children saying no, don't do the, no, don't photograph me, no, or children turning their bodies away because they don't want to be photographed. Or children demanding and not being able to move on to anything else until what they're doing is being photographed because they're valuing that about themselves and that practice as well. And that reproduction of themselves is highly valorised in some respect. Um, uh, what was I, there was something you said about, oh yeah, but this notion of the, um, uh, you know, this is, this is the idea that the representation is becoming more, is taking more precedence over the actual act of being with children in play and doing stuff with children in the everyday. And, you know, I, I, I was a bit of a tongue-in-cheek putting the picture with the teacher with the camera there, saying, I'm not playing with my camera, I'm documenting children. But in actual fact, that's sometimes what it feels like when I go into an early childhood service if I'm visiting student teachers. And... You know, people are diving for their devices. I mean, gosh, there's enough of that in everyday life. I don't want that in the early child. I don't want. To, I don't want that in my grandkids' lives. That's for sure. Yeah, I'd rather they were with the people. I, I do appreciate the photos myself when I get them as a grandparent, but you know. <laughs>